even A. What is your sole purpose at first date? To do whatever you tell me to, Drill Sergeant? That's a brilliant idea. You must be a damn genius. You must have an IQ of 160. Now get the first tape. I run this show. I don't care what Drill Sergeant is. You heard me? First takes in the hands. It's a new day, baby. <laughs> it's a new day here on the Stephen A. Smith Show as well. Holla at your boy. Let's go. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you as I love to do every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday over the digital airwaves of YouTube. As usual, we're here in our official studio. Thanks to our official studio sponsor, FanDuel Sportsbook. FanDuel is the official sports betting company of the Stephen A. Smith Show. By the way, my followers, my subscribers are approaching 300,000 in less than just six months. I'm honored and privileged to have that luxury. Please like and continue to like and follow the Stephen A. Smith Show on YouTube. Click the bell to get notified of all of our new content. And be sure, by the way, to pick up a copy of my New York Times bestselling book, Straight Shooter, a memoir of second chances and first takes. Um, Religiously, when I've started this show, I've always told you that we would be starting at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Pacific. I also gave you the new phone line that, that, that I've installed, 888-SAS-5303. That's 888-SAS-5303. That's 888-727-5303. That number hasn't changed, and neither is my desire for you to call into the show. But it's going to be a little bit different because I'm going to be taping the show for the foreseeable future until I'm, my studio is finished. I'm building a new studio. And until that studio is finished, I'm not going to go live. I'm going to record this podcast probably like an hour or so before it actually gets posted um, just to make sure that I don't have those buffering issues and stuff like that you guys have been witnessing over the last few episodes. So my apologies for those technical difficulties. This is a way to alleviate that. And the reason I give out the number, because even though I'm taping this probably an hour before the show actually gets posted, I'm giving out that number because while I'm doing this, it's called live to tape. You can call in and I can answer your calls while I'm taping the show. So when it actually when it actually gets posted, your phone calls will be a part of that particular episode just an hour later than you anticipated. My goal is to have this podcast posted at least by uh, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 2 p.m. Pacific every weekday. So I'm going to move it back an hour for the purposes of being able to tape and what have you. So I beg your indulgence, uh, your patience. I thank you for both. I really, really appreciate the support and keep it coming, and I'm going to keep on coming. Let's move on to the first topic of the show because the NFL season began last night, and as I predicted, the Detroit Lions won the game. But it's nothing to brag about because I picked them to win the game by default. You see, the moment I heard that Travis Kelsey, the all-world tight end for the Kansas City Chiefs, was going to be gone, he was going to be out, okay, because of aggravating the cap or whatever the hell it was, I said to myself, you know something? They ain't winning this game. Because Marquez Valdez-Scantlin, I'm not sure about him. Kadarius Tony, I damn sure wasn't sold on him. Remember, the Giants gave him up for a reason. Now, he may have helped the Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl last year in his performance in the Super Bowl against the Philadelphia Eagles, but he's still an unproven commodity. A commodity, no doubt, but an unproven one. And sure enough, last night, that was the case. See, Jared Goff, who's now 2-0 versus Patrick Mahomes, by the way, that same Jared Goff is an individual that showed up after failing to move the ball on like six or seven consecutive drives, ended up driving the Lions 91 yards for a game-winning touchdown. But the Lions basically put up just 14 points. Prior to that, all right, Patrick Mahomes wasn't able to do much, but it wasn't his fault. Did y'all know Kadarius Tony dropped four passes? Four passes. Four passes! OK, let's get that out of the way. The other thing we have to get out of the way is the fact that Valdez Scantlin and Tony couldn't get open. Now, you had guys like Bell and Noah Gray, the tight ends replacing uh, Travis Kelsey. Uh, they got some tight ends there. If I were the Kansas City Chiefs and Andy Reid, I would be thinking about utilizing a dual tight end system the way Bill Belichick once did. Um, and Josh McDaniels once did as the offensive coordinator in New England with Tom Brady when he had Gronk and Aaron Hernandez. What I'm saying is, 
is that it's important if you are the Kansas City Chiefs. You might want to think about that. What I saw from Gray and Bell put Travis Kelsey in a lineup considering what the receivers are incapable of giving you because there's no Tyreek Hill coming through that door. You might want to consider that. The other thing I wanted to point out real quickly is that let's not forget the fact that this is the first time we've seen Andy Reid without Eric Bieniemy, the former offensive coordinator who's now the assistant head coach and offensive coordinator in Washington, D.C., working for the Washington Commanders, the most corniest name in the NFL. Andy Reid was on his own. And the Kansas City Chiefs still seemed ill-equipped to do anything about it. But again, there were a lot of dropped passes. And so that's what we have to take into consideration. Detroit Lions, major props to them. Dan Campbell, I'm a fan. And he's changed the culture of that franchise. They believe in themselves. They got a lot of talent. This kid Jamal Gibbs is no joke. Neither is their receiving corps. Their defense is vastly improved. Jared Goff is showing, is reminding folks why he coached the quarterback the Los Angeles Rams to a Super Bowl a few years back when they lost to New England. And Dan Campbell is a player's coach, and you can tell. So I'm going to give props where it's due to the Detroit Lions, but we'll see what happens in the NFC North as the NFL season progresses. Vikings no longer have Dalvin Cook. Packers no longer have Aaron Rodgers. And the Chicago Bears don't have a damn thing outside of Justin Fields. So we'll see what happens. Let me move on to a subject that's near and dear to me right now, and that subject is Shannon Sharp. You saw that opening uh, with myself and Shannon Sharp. It was a cold open I did on Memorial Day, his first day, a day in which we did 727,000 views in linear television, just breaking records. It was second, the second highest rated show of the year for first take. I had the first highest after the Super Bowl in February. But Shannon Sharp is a welcomed addition to the show. And in his two days that we've been together, we've done 727,000 viewers one day, 512,000 viewers the next day. Um, and ESPN usually averages, meaning first take on ESPN usually averages close to half a million viewers each morning. Um, I got a lot of respect for Shannon Sharp, and I got to tell you, working with him thus far has been an absolute pleasure. Make no mistake about it. I give him a lot of props, a lot of credit. And it I really appreciate him reminding me and reinforcing why I went out there and recruited him and got him to come on the first take after he was let go by FS1. Um, we talked on his podcast about this very subject when Shannon Sharp asked me, um, why did I want him and why did I go to bat for him? When I was on his podcast called Club Shay Shay, I want y'all to see this interaction between myself and Shannon Sharp explaining exactly why I went after him and why I wanted him on first take with me. Take a look. I remember when I first arrived on first take and I rolled up in there and I saw a bunch of white folks. And I said, yo, where the brothers and the <laughs> sisters at? You know what I worry about? The day that I want to leave and I haven't done anything to create opportunities for us to continue. And so for me, it's like, I look at you, I think that you're smart, you're obviously incredibly accomplished, and then your heart, being con a conscientious brother, caring about the issues that you caring about, speaking about the issues that you speak about. Nah, brother, iron sharpens iron. Now the number one reason I came out, Shannon Sharp, and I said, I want Shannon Sharp on first take, because I wanted the world to know that you were wanted. I didn't want you to be in a situation where the sports world looked at you and said, what do you do? He must have done something. Mm -hmm. Persona non grata. Yep. This is a brother that I think has done a lot of good work on television that has helped our community. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it's incumbent upon me because of the perch that I sit on to let them know right. he's wanted. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, I meant that from the bottom of my heart and I mean it today. And I feel compelled to reiterate something that's very important to me that y'all understand. I'm not here to make friends. That's not why I'm in this business. That's not what I'm about. That's not what I do. But it doesn't mean I want enemies. And it doesn't mean that I don't sincerely want to help my brothers and sisters. I'm not anti anything. One of the greatest women I've ever known was white. She happened to be my grandmother. She taught me about racism, too, and what racism really, really looks like. 
and what a lot of white folks are thinking from time to time. And that's a different subject for another day. But I say all of that to say that I don't look at somebody's skin color and judge their character. I look at their actions and their behavior and I judge their character. But the same is applicable to white people, to black people, I'm sorry. You know, one of the things that I religiously have stated, you know, you've got black folks, a lot of black folks that are quick to remind you that the first human being on the face of this earth created from the dust of the ground, the man who walked in the garden with God and talked with God himself, Adam, was a black man. And I often say to people, that's the good part. You know what the bad part is? Cain, that means Cain was black too. And he murdered his own brother. If you want to get biblical as a Christian. So what I'm saying to you is that just because you black don't mean you good. And just because you're white doesn't mean you're evil. One's actions speak louder than just words. In our business, the business that Shannon Sharp is in, the business that I'm in, our actions coincide with our words because it speaks to our intent. And I knew what Shannon was going through because it happened to me when I was let go in 2009 and left for dead and they was ready to write me off. I didn't have a Stephen A. Smith in that position that this Stephen A. Smith is in to look out for me. No matter what work I did, no matter what I accomplished, no matter how hard I worked, no matter how much better I may or may not have been than others, I didn't have anybody in a position to do but so much for me initially, which was why I was unemployed from 2009 to 2010. Which is why when I finally got a job in 2010 for Fox Sports Radio. I still needed to work to gain traction again, which is why when I got hired back by ESPN in 2011, I was prohibited from being on television. Restricted to radio and radio only. I know what Shannon is going through or was going through. And that brother didn't deserve that. And the more I work with him, the more I enjoy him. To be in his presence, I got to tell y'all, all a brother wanted was respect. Now, I ain't getting him and skip business. That's their business. But I can tell you as somebody who's dealing with him directly, all he wants is to be respected and appreciated. And he already knows he has that from me. I told him on his podcast to his face, and I'll tell you, my audience, to my face, my job with him, Marcus Spears, Swagoo, Ryan Clark, Kimberly Martin, Mina Kimes, Dan Orlovsky, Mad Dog Russo, the list goes on and on and on. And that includes J.J. Reddick, Jay Williams, Monica McNutt during the NBA season, along with my boy Big Perk, Kendrick Perkins, all of them. Because of the perch that I've been blessed and lucky enough to be sitting in. If they're not better off, not just as talent, but making better money and being more successful. During or in the aftermath of their time on first take than they were before they arrived on first take. I have failed them. Because it's my job. As the marquee talent on the show as the executive producer on the show, with connections to the bosses. I didn't ask to be executive producer. They asked me to be executive producer. It's my obligation, along with my boy Pete McConvo, by the way, who's spectacular, just a spectacular producer, okay? And James Dunn. I can't take any of the credit. And Antoine Lewis, before he suffered from being, you know, one of the cuts, he was a great producer. I didn't do this alone. I don't do this alone. But because of the position that I'm in, I owe it to those guys to give them all I've got and to make sure that as I shine, they shine too. And of course, Molly Karam, who I love dearly, and I don't ever want to do the show without. So let me just get that out of the way. And I've said what I had to say about Shannon Sharp. It is an appropriate transition to go from him to Skip Bayless. 
Skip Bayless and I don't talk too much these days. We're too busy focusing on our own shows. And one could say competing with one another. Um, I don't view it that way. But I understand if anybody else does. Skip Bayless and I have really gone back, or uh, uh, just recently gone back and forth. Um, because he told the story with Richard Sherman on their first day, August 28th, when he was talking to Richard Sherman about what their beef was years ago when they appeared on First Take together. And Skip Bayless was explaining some things, and he was talking about how we were on probation, but it wasn't because of me. So when Richard Sherman attacked him, Skip couldn't hit back at him because we were trying to get a show on in the afternoon, which was true. We were trying to get a show on in the afternoon. And that was why Skip did not go right back at Richard Sherman when Richard Sherman attacked him and called them a cretin and said, I'm better at life than you and all of this other stuff. But Skip Bayless in telling that story and recalling that story took the liberty of pointing out how we were going through a probationary period, but it wasn't because of him. It had nothing to do with him. And I challenged that when I saw that and I came on my podcast and I explained. I came right here and I explained. That wasn't entirely true. Okay? And so... I had my own comments and I want to play those comments for you right now. What I said that Skip took umbrage with. Play that, please. They had accused Skip Bayless, meaning the public, of being a caricature of himself. And even though Skip was incredibly proud of his Tim Tebow coverage, the bosses weren't necessarily enamored with it. I wasn't the only reason that probationary period per se existed. It existed because the network wanted to make sure that our show wasn't one that just generated ratings, but one that didn't cause them embarrassment and shame. That is where the probationary period came from, too. If you know anything about Skip Bayless, he's going to have something to say. He's earned that right. He has that right. And he took the liberty of going on his own podcast to not necessarily his word, but the head, the word of the headlines to sort of set me straight about what actually happened. Here was his response to my assertions on his own podcast. To all of the above, I say baloney. There was no shtick involved in all those shows we did on Tim Tebow. I was just me. Actually, the reason we were on probation was something that Rob Parker said about Robert Griffin on First Take. This was in December of 2012. Stephen A. Smith, I love you, man. I really do, with all my heart and soul. But that is the whole truth and nothing but the truth so help me God. Skip Bayless, that is not the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. So I don't mean to go against you or God himself, but I'm going to in this particular instance if the Lord himself disagreed with you, or agreed with you and disagreed with me, rather. I'm going to go against that. Um, love you too, brother. Always will. Um, but let's get one thing straight right now. I don't lie. And I'm certainly not saying that you do, but I don't. Ain't important enough to lie, to be quite honest with you. So let's set the record straight with specifically that point. I don't recall my suspension being a part of the uh, probationary period. I don't recall bringing that up because that did happen in 2014. You're absolutely right. And you are right when you bring up Rob Parker and what he wants your colleague at Fox Sports 1 now. Um, and those of you, by the way, who don't know, Rob Parker and I are very close. Rob Parker is a mentor and a friend who has been my friend for nearly 40 years. And to put it in his proper perspective, he's the godfather 
to my youngest daughter. That's how close Rob Parker and I are. So I don't bring that up to throw anything in his direction, but Skip was right about that being a part of the probationary period. What Skip is either wrong about or has forgotten was that the honchos at ESPN were not happy with the constant Tebow coverage every day. Jamie Horowitz was happy, our former boss. Skip was very happy. The ratings, it was generating ratings. Nobody's saying it was failing. But because the show was about Tim Tebow every day before I arrived, that was a problem for the bosses, Skip. You know that. So much so, Skip, Remember when you wondered aloud in a very stressful fashion? And I'm not getting in anybody's private business. I would never do that to you. You felt they gave you the impression that they were ashamed of the Tebow coverage and you pounded your fist on the table and said, I'm proud of it. And I should be proud of it because we had the ratings. And I said to you, yeah, but we might not need to tell them that because we want to get on in the afternoons. Remember that? I do. No one is saying that Tim Tebow did not generate ratings. Nobody is saying that the show was not successful. Nobody is saying that the public at large, while some people abhorred it, a lot of people loved it. Nobody is saying that. All I'm saying is that by name, John Skipper, Norby Williamson, and John Wildhack, the three bosses who were in charge of ESPN at that time, was not proud of the coverage that the show was getting because they thought it compromised their, what they wanted their network to represent and they would much rather have preferred people was leaning on sports centers, this flagship show, rather than that. That is a fact. And for anybody that doubts me, John Skipper is now partnered with Dan Lepertard with Metalog Media. Ask him. John Wildtech is a sports editor. At the, is, I'm sorry, the, the, the athletic director, at Syracuse University. Ask him. Norby Williamson is still at ESPN. I'm telling the truth. I just wanted to say that. It's not throwing any shade on you, Skip. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. I'm just saying that me or Rob Parker were not the only reason we were on probation. You, it has something to do with you too. That's all I'm saying. Nothing more than that. Absolutely nothing more than that. So help me God. And I love you too. And you know that. 888 SAS 5303. That's 888 727 5303. Before we go to break, giving you that number to feel free to call in. A couple of days ago, Dan Levertard was a guest on this show. And I just wanted to say, just like I don't mind. Whether I speak to Skip or don't speak to Skip, see him or don't see him, I will always love my brother from another mother. I will always love his wonderful wife, Ernestine, who's been nothing but wonderful to me. Okay? And regardless of how many times we disagree about certain things, it's not going to change my feelings for him, and I will never disrespect him. Okay? But it is important to point out the love part because I got to tell you, after my conversation with Dan Lebertard the other day, it had me thinking about, how much better we can all be. And I want to applaud Dan Levitar for that because I really appreciate it. Because the way we had that conversation for those 30 minutes, the way we communicated with one another, we agreed without being disagreeable. We got along. We showed respect for one another and just articulated our differences for you all to interpret and decipher and ultimately take a side. And that's what makes the world better. 
Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Listen to me and Dan Lebertard with our closing remarks on the Stephen A. Smith show right here just a couple of days ago. But I think as long as both of us are in this business doing what we're doing and more importantly willing to give an opportunity to others on the come up to really shine and do what they're capable of doing as well, I think it'll all be just fine when all is said and done. I also hold you in the highest regard because I do believe that you aspire to uh, so many of the journalistic tenets that I hold dear. The feeling is mutual. I got you, my man. I appreciate you. You know, I love you, crazy ass. You know that. We'll do it. We'll Likewise. Be, we'll, my we'll, sanctimonious ass. <laughs> That's right. It's <laughs> the way it should be, y'all. That's exactly the way it should be. It's okay. Nobody's going to lose any sleep. Okay? Now, having said all of that, Dan Lebertard, please don't get on me for and accuse me of dehumanizing an athlete. Not that you did. But I'm just saying, please don't do that here when I talk, when I take the liberty of closing this particular segment by talking about Anthony Davis of the Los Angeles Lakers, who just signed for $186 million. Do y'all know that this dude, this dude, Anthony Davis, who is a superstar when healthy and plays his A game, just signed a three-year $186 million deal. After he got the damn money, he going to sit up there and tell the Lakers he need help at the five position. See, this is the bullshit now. This is the bullshit. Now, I understand the Lakers agreed to terms with free agent big man Christian Wood. Christian Wood ain't no big man. He's a tall man. He's not big. He's tall. Okay? But let's be very, very clear about something if you're Anthony Davis. $186 million. $186 million. You average $62 million a year. You just got swept in the Western Conference Finals. You got outplayed by Nikola Jokic. Dropping 41 game. You did, Anthony Davis. And 11 the next. With your six flags roller coaster self. And you're going to sit up there and ask for help after getting $186 million. $186 million. See, this is what, this is what drives me crazy. I love Anthony Davis as a person, and I love him as a player when he's on his A game. But it is an absolute travesty that this man consistently finds himself in worse shape than LeBron James. You're supposed to be helping LeBron James, relieving him, letting him know that approaching his 21st season, he ain't got nothing to worry about because you got it. Instead, he got to act like he's in its 10th year in the league. Not just with his game, but physically, because you ain't available half the damn time. You're missing more games than LeBron. I'm going to be cool and take a break, y'all. And it's a good one, too. Because I got my man Cedric the Entertainer coming up next. He got a few things that he wants to share with y'all. And I was happy to oblige him. One of the greats. In the comedic world, Cedric the Entertainer, up next right here with Stephen A. On the Stephen A. Smith Show, back with more in a minute. Snap into action this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. I'm gassed up for this upcoming season, y'all. I'm telling you that right now. I can hardly wait another second. And I know the best way to enjoy every single game, even if it's not your favorite team, is by putting down some bets, you know? Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets. Win or lose, I don't see why you wouldn't get in on this opportunity and get your fill of all the spreads, the player props, the futures, the over and unders, all that stuff that makes the game that much more exciting. So visit FanDuel.com slash SAS and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the National Football League. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued is now withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text NEXT STEP to 53342 in Arizona. 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.com. 
ksa.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700, or visit ksgamblinghelp.com in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit mdgamblinghelp.org in Maryland. Visit 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia, or call 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts, or call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest has already been on the show, um, but I had to have him back because not only is he one of the funniest men out there, the brother has now written his first novel, okay, which I cannot wait to discuss. Welcome, one of the original kings of comedy, award-winning actor, comedian, producer, philanthropist, and author, as my brother Steve Harvey would say, Cedric the entertainer yeah, what's man. going on big time what's going on man how you doing man my dog what's up brother all is well man, man. It, it's, it's good to see you man right man man before i get into you because there's a lot to talk about with you i mean did did, did, did you see me and the smith family embarrass ourselves on family feud did you see that man, I, ain't I, scored, I ain't scored a damn point man, man, <laughs> scored a damn point. that family feud it looks so easy when you at home playing man and then you get out there you like whoa why y'all didn't got the easy questions man i can tell you all the members of, of martin's uh cast yep. y'all in all <laughs> Exactly. You know, they set it up, though, because they talk, they encourage you to go. If you win, you know, take it. And you yeah. got eight answers on the board and we get like six or seven, but we didn't get the eight. And then somebody else get the eight and they win the damn round. It's like, oh, my Lord. But it is what it is, man. I had a blast, man. But listen, we ain't here to talk about that. We're here to talk about you because you got a novel out. Yeah. I run, this is the crazy part. It's called Flipping Boxcars. Yeah, I want you to talk about that title. Where did that title come from, and what compelled you to write a novel, a, a fiction novel? Yeah, you know the the the, the story. Of this book is really motivated by uh, my my fascination with my grandfather that I never met. So, mm. so we have these things in, in, you know, in our culture where people go, boy, you walk just like your daddy. You look, <laughs> boy, you you sound just like, you know, right, and it right. might be a generation removed. I, you know, you never even met him. People say, y'all sound the same. You talk, you walk just like him. You stand like him. So people would say that to me about my grandfather, but he, I, he had passed before I was even born. So... Mm. In the, in the in in those fascinations, I started to think about what kind of man was he, what kind of things did he do. I took stories from my mom and my my uncles, and then made up a fictional character. So you know, it was just like uh, you know, and I, I love the Walter Mosley books, like you know. Right. Devil in a Blue Dress and that that's right, thing. Walter Mosley. Yeah, yeah. That's right with Denzel and and and, and you know I, who am I got? I got brain lock here. Yeah. Uh, you know, damn, yeah, damn, damn, damn. Yeah, Cheeto I know you talk about. You there you stuff. go, Don and Cheeto. That's yeah. what I was thinking about. Denzel and Don Cheeto. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah you know. Those, so those, those kind of characters made me think of this world and want to write this book, man. So what did you find out about your grandfather who you had never met? What did you find out about him that made you? you know, made you find yourself so fascinated by him? Man, you know, he was really, he was, uh, you know, like a guy from that time. He was a very entrepreneurial personality, man. He had he had a, a restaurant. He had a, a, a gambling hall that he had actually uh, did with the sheriff of the town. They had... Um, they had a little businesses where they would actually move liquor uh, doing, you know, post prohibition. It was still right. opportunities in some of these, you know, kind of small cities where alcohol wasn't a thing. So they lived a little underworld life. He was the sheriff's partner. So they did it on the low. Right. Uh, I, I say he invented the first food truck. My man, <laughs> right. would, my man would take food out to the people that worked in the fields. And, right. uh, you know, he got a school bus and would load up the food and take it out there and, mm -hmm. and hit everybody for a quarter and they would eat and get drinks and that was his first little one another hustle he had uh well dressed these were yep. things that i started to learn about him that i felt like kind of came to me through osmosis or dna mm -hmm. or whatever the case right is that i picked up these tools what did your parents tell you about your grandfather you know, my mother, you know, it was my mother's dad. She just told me that he was, you know, very witty. He was a very, always a well-dressed man, very stylish. 
uh, you know, and always had a lot of like kind of like irons in the fire. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it feels like this acting, exactly. doing stand up, right. writing books, you know, but whatever it was for the 40s, you know. So right. I just kind of, you know, felt like that was him. And but he was a guy that took a lot of chances and lived mm -hmm. in the underworld a bit. So, and of mm -hmm. course, that's, you know, a lot of times that's what we were relegated to, though, yep. you know, as, as coaches, and especially men who had hubris and attitude, you just right. couldn't really be out front. You had to do it in the underworld. So these were things I learned about him that I felt got inspired to uh, create this character. And a lot of people don't realize is one thing, you know, just just as men and as black men, you know, you learn as you grow older, you admire cat like cats like that, because what happens is you see that they're not one dimensional. They didn't want to imprison themselves to one genre or one job. You didn't want to go do a nine to five, limit yourself to that, depending on a pension, depending on a man not to fire you. And, and ultimately you out of you shit out of luck and you wondering what the hell you're going to do with your life moving forward. The more versatile you were, the more the, the, the more of a chance it was that you was going to be successful. You were going to be maintained. You're going to be able to maintain or elevate your quality of life. A lot of people don't realize that. But here's my question to you. You brought up Devil in a Blue Dress, the movie, based off of the book. And obviously Denzel Washington starred in the movie along with Don Cheadle, right? Yeah. How come, how come this is a novel as opposed to a movie? You know, I think, you know, I actually started out, this really was one of the, the basis of the idea was I was writing a TV show, like a series for right. it. And, you know, the opportunity uh, in trying to like cram it all in and tell that story, this book right. came about. And I just thought it was like a, a, you know, a greater experience for me to be able to kind of like iron out exactly who he was, tell his story in long mm -hmm. form. And, right. and then, you know, always got the opportunity to do the book. I got the rights at this point. So we're already shaping that up. Like I said, I already had that idea germinated. Right. So now it's just like, okay, the book lands, we get some rhythm and then I'll uh, create the show. Is that the way to do it in this day and age? If you want to really, really make a movie or make a TV series, some people obviously go that route, but writing a book, allowing it to gain traction on that level and then transferring that into a greater success by taking it to the theater, the big screen, or even the smaller screen, the television is the way to go to do. Do you find that writing a book might be the weather, the best way to go? Is that your know, thinking process now? I don't know. I mean, with the streamers, we live in a world where people definitely want to just see great content. And I think we right. live in a more visual area, but now with audible books and the idea of people like hearing a real story and being able to use their imagination, I think that sparks greater interest in the, the kind of deepness of a character, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you find yourself being more intrigued. Plus the book, you know, it can sit around and last for years and sit on your shelf and you might look over and grab it and snatch a few pages every now and then. So I just love that the fact that it, it exists as this piece of literature. My mother was a reading specialist. I grew up in a house where books was everywhere. Reading right. was everything. So, you know, this was an opportunity for me to kind of break out of my normal thing and do something different. TV, film, you know, live performance as my move, right. but to write a book and to write a novel was a different muscle for me. And so I chose this experience and right. didn't know that I still got those available to me to be able to turn this into a TV show. M Man, I can't front. I wrote a book. I wrote my autobiography, memoir, you know, straight shooter memoir, Enjoyed second it. chances and first takes nine weeks on the New York times bestseller list with the book and the audio book. And I swear to you, all I can think about is I never want to write a book again. I don't want any parts of that, Cedric. It's, it's hard as hell. I don't want out, no part bro. of it, bro. I don't, I don't want no part of it, Cedric. I pour, you poured it out, man. I read it. Oh. I enjoyed it, man. I listened Thanks, to the man. audio book. You know, and the thing is, is when you do a, bi a biography, you pour it all out, man. That's right. Now, if you start to think about, like, you know, like, say, if you do a story of big gains or somebody, like, That's in right. your book, where you decide, right. I'm just going to take a little piece of his yeah. life and tell right. a more magnificent story of a, a right. coach that did... You might have right. more fun because that this way you're not really locked in. The you read a good the, point. Yeah. That's a good point. I, I've also thought about murder mysteries and stuff like that. You know, yeah. the crime novels and stuff like that. But I'm just saying, oh my lord, it was so hard. I'm like, I'm like, damn, this is some hard stuff, yeah. bro. No, it's, it's, hard. It's, it's more than what people think, and I and I, I kind of say that in the back in my acknowledgments that mm -hmm. when you start a book, the way you come out on the other end is not the same person you were when you started. Everybody right. got this idea like I could just rah, 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 mm -hmm. and write it down mm -hmm. and be done, but it, right. it don't work like that. This book. 
Now, by the way, it comes out to hit shelf September 12th. So everybody look for it. Hit shelf September 12th. Okay, so let's make that. We make, we're make going to make that point. It's going to hit shelves next week. That's number one. Number two, Hollywood Walk of Fame. You just received that a couple of years ago or so. I'm thinking about all the accomplishments and where you are now and the kind of impact these kind of things have had on your life. When you think about all the things that you've done and now you're an author, not to say because you also written a book before, obviously, but you you think about yourself as an author, an actor, a comedian, etc. What has profoundly affected you most? I'm not talking about the public. I'm just talking about you as you sit back and reflect on the things that you've done. What has had the most impact on you walking in yourself, your soul every single day? You know, I mean, you know, a couple of things. I mean, I love great experiences and things that I've had, actually had to do. Probably the thing that I felt like stretched me the most is I had a short run on Broadway. Uh, we did uh, American Buffalo uh, with right. John Leguizamo, Haley Joe Osment. But that was a that was a, one of the times where, uh, you know, I couldn't rely on my you know, my my natural ability to turn something into a joke because Broadway is all about the playwright. So I had to learn how to learn those words. I had to be an actor. I had to become an actor. And it made me yeah. really respect the Denzels and the Samuels of the world, like people who really go. And when they land in a movie role, they bring that character to life. And so that was something that I feel like was probably one of the most you know, significant things in my life that changed me, that made me like look at what I do and and, and respect it more for the you know the the, the honor of doing the job and, and and satisfying what it is when you go to work on a movie screen or on a TV show, what it is that you're trying to deliver from this character. Who's the person in Hollywood that has had the biggest impact on you? Man, you know, it got to be my dog for the most part, Steve Harvey. I mean, you know, right. of. Hub was the person that like kind of really pulled me into the game. Uh, you know, he was, and then being on the show and riding, being able to ride shotgun on the Steve Harvey show, like in the shotgun seat, I got to yep. see, you know, I got to be privy to some of the meetings. I got to be privy to the deal right. making, you know? Yep. And so when I was able to kind of go into and then find my light and go into my own thing, I had a lot of that knowledge. Plus Steve was always a bit of a rebel, a guy that, you know, and he's done it in many levels. He was yep. inside the world. Then he jumped outside the world. So I kind of operate like that too, even so I'm a, inside Hollywood. I'm not really uh, a Hollywood dude. I kind of that's right. Like Neither am I. Most thing. real, mo most real dudes ain't. Most real dudes ain't. I mean, yeah. when we come to Hollywood, we come to Hollywood and make some money. We come to Hollywood to handle our business. Yeah, exactly. We be damned if we gonna go Hollywood. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And, and we just can't do it like that. It's just not our flavor. It's not who we are. Yeah, man, no doubt. Yeah. So when you think about that, man, I, I mean, do you take time as you reflect on all the things that you've done? Do you take time to imagine or reflect on what it's been like for all of y'all? I think about Bernie Mac, God rest his wonderful soul, yeah, and I'm imagining what he would have accomplished had he still been here. I'm seeing what Steve accomplishes. People throwing you know, darts at him every day, arrows, and I tell Steve all the time, they only doing it because you matter, my brother. They only doing it because you matter. Don't even worry about it. Shrug that bad boy off. Keep it moving. D.L. Hughley. Yeah, um. A serious brother, highly educated, highly conscientious. I got a lot of love for him, too. And of course, you do you do you reflect on the kind of collective impact the four of you had? Or do you find yourself thinking more about yourself from the standpoint? Let them do them. I think about it, but I really don't want to get caught up in that too much. What's the mindset? Oh, no, like? man, I love that. I mean, the fact that, again, both uh, all three of us together, you know, again, our yeah. feet is the legend, the great Bernie Mac, but That's right. we, Steve, and DL were together at my tournament last week, man. Wow. And so we still, like, bond together. We still, like, hang out. And so, you know, that that is, is, a, is a unique thing to have that kind of Kendrick, that brotherhood with someone and still be mm -hmm. individually making it. Me and right. DL toured quite a bit all the time. We just did yep. a big tour last year. Uh, yep. You know, straight jokes, no chases. We was out. <laughs> and so we get out there, man. And so I I love that. And I know B Mac was here, you know, he, he oh. was already gone, gone. So by the, right. you know, by the time he was getting ready, you know, what we got going on now with streaming and all these ideas, B Mac would have just been, you know, another another right. superstar out there just doing his thing, you know. Like and I, I love the fact. 
I love the fact that you brought that up because in the times that we're living in, we see the writer's strike, we see the guild, everything, we see SAG after, we see, we know what's going on in Hollywood right now. And we're really hoping and praying that things get, you know, make a turn for the better quicker, sooner than, rather than later. But a lot of times you see people out here, they're scared to death. Because of the changing times with streaming, linear television, the ESPN, who I work for, once had 100 million subscribers, it's down to 70. People reject it's going to be like about 50 million in a few years because of the advent of digital and social media, all of this other stuff. And I'm going like this. Well, all right, that's fine. But people keep forgetting something. Content's king. And as long as you got content along with an, inor an inordinate number of outlets to distribute that content, this ain't something to be depressed about. It's something to be excited about. That's my take. What's yours? No doubt, man. I always say, you know, life, you know, I, I tell my kids this, you know, time don't go backwards, we go forwards. You can't put stuff back in the box. You know, everybody want to cry about what's next. I just remember, like, when, you know, you couldn't even dunk in the NBA because black people was the only people that could do it. And, you know, you, you, they used to be like, hey, you can't do that. That's a good right. rule. Now you right. don't want to see a game without one. So you recognize that, you know, AI, all these things, technology, streaming, these things you can't put back in the box. You just you, right. you know you might have had a time you know, you might have had a time where we all love record players and hearing the sound on, right. on, on old record. Right. But, you know, don't get me wrong. When I got my phone, I want them same songs. I want to be able yeah, to right. just hit it on my phone and play it. So I'm, I'm glad technology is available to me. And I, you just got to learn to adapt, grow and move because that's what the world is, man. We going forward. That's all. That's all we can do. So I you've always. You've always been moving forward. Like I said, you just wrote this novel. It's called Flipping. It's called Flipping Boxes. Okay, Flipping Box Cars. I'm yeah. sorry. It's it it, debut, it puts on shelves. It, it it hits the shelves September 12th. So we definitely going to talk about. We already talked about that. Want to remind everybody. You also wrote a book in the past, Grown Ass Man, which is which was a collection of 23 comedic essays. Let's not forget about that. Yeah. You got your show, The Neighborhood. By the way, you just reached. You recently reached this year 100 episodes. 100 yep. episodes on your CBS sitcom, The Neighborhood. Uh, you not only star alongside the lovely Tashina Arna, you know how much I love Pam. I, I wish she would always be Pam for Mark, for me, forever, forever. Oh. But I love her dearly, and she does great, great work. But you executive produced this show as well. Yeah. As you sit back and think about all of those things, where does Cedric the Entertainer go from here, my man? Like, we just finished talking about the different outlets, the different opportunities, the yeah. novel that you've written, the movies and the television series you may create. Where's your mindset right now in terms of what's next? Steady, you know, steady, steady creating, man. You know, I definitely want to produce more shows now. I love I'm building, building my company. I produce most of the things that I do. And now we're doing things for others with my uh, show, uh, Bird Bear Entertainment. We got the show Johnson on Bounce. Uh, we had right. another show Finding Happy on there for a minute. Dog, I just had a deer walk up in my front yard, looking at <laughs> and looking crazy. at you, right? Look yeah, at, said, looking at hey, you, man, looking at, at you, like what you looking at? I'm looking like, at you, like what you looking at? He looking at you, like what you looking at, right? Yeah, he just like walked, looking at my glass door, like yo. I'm like, bro, what you doing, man? So, um, yep. but you know, really, that's me, man. Just steady moving. I definitely want to create stuff for others. We got deals going with so many dope of the young talent coming out. You know, uh, developing show Ha Ha Davis and Country Wayne and and right. you know and, and 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 Tracy Morgan, one of my partners. We got yes. stuff that we're developing. So as soon as the strike is over, we're ready to get out there and make things pop, man. And so I'm steady on that grind and trying to get take the opportunities I have, and of course, you know, do some cold bounce passes to people. Right. That you know they can you know take it take their shots. What advice would you give to an aspiring uh, uh, producer, an aspiring production company? When you talk about creating content in this day and age, you know I'm in the process of creating create a couple of docu series myself. I got one greenlit by ESPN already. Got a couple of other things coming down the pike as well. But no, very few people have enjoyed the success that you have enjoyed. What kind of advice would you bestow upon others? Well, I mean, definitely, man, you got to realize that you got to have tough skin in this business. It's all a, it's a it's a volume business. You look for things that you are truly inspired by, that you like, that you enjoy, that you think other people enjoy. And then you really work hard to find the right people to shape them, to turn them into solid ideas, not something that you just got off the whim. 
and then of course be able to be able to to take them nose and and, and right. get back on that bicycle and ride again. That's one right. thing about the the producer game. It's it's kind of zero sum, man. You're gonna have a lot a lot of shots at the basket, and some of them gonna go in. If you get hot, then you get hot. But a lot of stuff that you shoot up there won't go, man. And that's just the way it is. Uh, so, but we we have to re- recognize that if we believe in something and you got you passionate about it. You work hard to put that right team together, and that's the way to do it. And just keep going. If somebody say no, keep going. Get it's all kinds of opportunities out here. One no is not the, the final answer. So that know that for sure. Flipping boxcars, the yeah. first novel ever written by the one and only Cedric the Entertainer. Yeah, Appreciate man. you, bro. Love you, bro. Proud of you, bro. Keep doing your thing. Keep inspiring. Keep showing us the way. Keep making things happen, my man. I really appreciate you talking to me, man. You take oh, care of yourself. Always. Stephen A., let's go, oh, no. man. For you know what, baby. <laughs> <The A. laughs> All right, my brother. Be good, man. Let's go, Be good. Dog. All right, good. man. Uh-huh. <laughs> My man is Cedric the Entertainer. I did that interview with him earlier in the week. Thanks so much for Cedric the Entertainer coming on with me right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show over the digital airwaves of YouTube. Always appreciate him. The brothers accomplished great, great things. He's done a lot over the years. I just wish they were all together live still. Bernie Mac, the late, great Bernie Mac. Miss him so much. D.L. Hughley, I know he can still do comedy because he's a comedic genius, but so many times I see him being quoted as always in regards to a serious issue, which, by the way, he's more than qualified to talk about because he's a highly, highly intelligent and brilliant brother. It's just that he's so funny, too, man. It would be, you know, it's nice to see him making a bunch of people laugh again, too. Him. With Cedric the Entertainer, of course, my man Steve Harvey. But nevertheless, they're all doing big things. They should always and eternally have our love. Um, and Cedric the Entertainer certainly, a, a, you know, that applies to him, obviously. Thanks again to him um, for coming back on the show. And I really, really appreciate it. Coming up, Israel Adesanya and the UFC 293. Plus your calls at 888-SAS-5303. That's 888-727-5303. All that and more coming up right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airwaves of YouTube coming at you at the very least every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Make sure to tune in, stick around, Stephen A. Smith Show. Um, As I stated at the top of the show, normally we would advertise we're coming on at 4 p.m. live Eastern time, 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, That's not going to be the case for the foreseeable future. I'm literally building a new studio as we speak and operating out of a different studio. And obviously that's been, there's been some trouble um, in terms of the buffering and other technological issues that is simply uh, too difficult to alleviate for the immediate moment. So as a result, um, I'm going to be taping my show, but in the midst of taping my show, I'm going to also make sure uh, that I'm alerting you to the number to call up. That's 888 Seven two seven five three zero three. That's eight 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 S A S five three zero three eight 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 S A S five three zero three. So while I'm in the midst of taping these calls, which is called live to tape, essentially I'm going to be taping the show like an hour before it's posted. Um, you know, if you call in an hour later, you know, or a couple hours later, you'll hear that your calls were included in the call. So feel free to call in because I love communicating with you all and I really, really appreciate the support and love. So I want to thank you for that. Let me get right to a real quick point. Um, I need to uh, hit on Coach Prime, Prime Time, Deion Sanders, uh, the unbelievable breakout game with Colorado beating the national runner-up last year in TCU. They beat him last weekend, 48-45. Deion Sanders making waves. Um, Do y'all know that the price for tickets is $417 per ticket? Do you know it's the 12th largest price for tickets for a regular season college football game? Like the 12th largest in NCAA history. Fine. Did you know that the Colorado uh, Buffaloes were 1-11 and last year? So Deion Sanders kept 10 scholarship players. He's got 86 new players. He's used the transfer portal. Um, He's got guys coming out of high school, guys coming from junior college, guys coming from other universities. And I'm looking at Colorado, and these brothers are fast. They are athletic. um, They're competitive. They believe. And Deion Sanders is no joke. No question about it. I believed. I believed. But not everybody did. 
Check out Deion Sanders talking to the media in the immediate aftermath of Colorado's road victory at TCU last week. What's up, boss? You believe now? You, you, hold on, hold on, hold on, oh no. Do you believe that? Huh? Oh no, no, no. I read through that bull junk you wrote down. I read through that. I sipped it through all that. Yeah. Oh no. Come on. Do you believe? You don't believe. You just answered it. You don't believe. Next question. Let me say this. I didn't necessarily agree with that about uh, from prime time. Only because football is a very volatile and violent sport. And it's one game. And one game doesn't make a season. One injury could cost you everything. One injury. What if Shador Sanders got injured? This is a quarterback for the Colorado Buffalo. This is the guy that is the son of Deion Sanders. He goes out there and he throws 510 yards on four touchdowns in his first Division I game. This brother, Travis Hunter, is spectacular. 11 receptions, 117 yards, plus he plays defense, and the brother had an interception. Before TCU, before the TCU game, Colorado was unranked. They're now 22 in the rankings. And by the way, nine players follow Deion Sanders from Jackson State to Colorado. Let me tell you something. I'm looking at the speed, the agility, the athleticism, the competitive fervor, and I love it. I absolutely, positively love it. And I'm, I'm getting on the media about it. I don't think that's smart. I don't think that's necessary, but it is prime time. And he's a real one. And he's my brother. So much so, I'm flying to the game tomorrow. I'm flying to the game. I'll be in attendance for that game. I'll be on the sidelines pregame. I'll, I'll probably hang out in the suite or something during the game. But I'm flying to the game. And I'm bringing Shannon Sharp with me. And I'm doing that just because prime time asked me to. It's my man. I'm going to the game. I want to see it in person. But they better not lose no damn Nebraska. I know Matt Rule's the new coach or whatever. They better not lose no damn Nebraska. I better not fly the hell all the way damn near across the country and you're going to lose to Nebraska. Okay? I don't want to hear that. Hell no. So, Colorado, handle your business. Stephen A. coming into the house. And I have no doubt they will handle their business, to be quite honest with you. Let me switch to this next subject real quick before I get to the calls at 888-SAS-5303. That's 888-SAS-5303. To the UFC, this weekend's UFC 293, Israel Adesanya, the reigning defending middleweight champion of the world, will take on this cat, Sean Strickland, in Sydney, Australia. It's the must-win matchup for the style bender. Okay, remember, Adesanya just reclaimed the UFC middleweight title in April against this nemesis, Alec, uh, you know, Alex Pajeda. Remember Alex Pajeda in the second round knockout? Remember that? And this is a guy that beat him by TKO before. This is a guy that when they were kickboxing, he beat Adesanya then. And so for Adesanya to go back into the octagon after losing uh, to the to – the, to Pajeda in a, in a fashion that he did, to go back in, next, in that octagon and to handle his business the way he did, I can't say enough about him. I really, really can't. Adesanya, to me, is the best in the world right now, unless you want to tell me to include John Bones Jones, who just came back after, what is it, a two- to three-year hiatus and beat Cyril Ghosn by choking him out, submitting him. But here's the bottom line. Adesanya's record is 24-2. and two. Strickland's 27-5. He's not to be... Um, dismissed, but it's very, very important to me that Adesanya wins this victory because this guy, Drikas, he was scheduled to face Adesanya this Saturday but pulled out months ago due to a foot injury. Now, he's a South African, and he's talking about how he's the real African and not Adesanya, and that, you know, who's Nigerian, and obviously that, that just got stuff boiling. Now, that's the fight I wanted to see. Well, we got to make sure we still get that fight. Drikas Duplessis. I can't wait for him and Adesanya to fight. But if Adesanya loses to Strickland, we might have to wait a little bit longer than we want to for that. So I hope that doesn't happen. Like I said, 888-SAS-5303. That's 888-SAS-5303. That's 888-727-5303. Your calls right now. Let's go to the lines. Felix in Brooklyn, you're live with Stephen A. What's up, Felix? What's going on, Stephen A.? Quickly, just uh, thank, thank you for your show. Um, just want to know, 
what uh, would you like to see the Knicks' next move be, whether it be via free agency or trade, that'll help them get closer to championship contention? Me personally, I'm hoping and praying that this is the last year Gian- uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo is in, is in Milwaukee and he wants to come to New York City. I mean, if you told me that we got to suck this season just to get Giannis Antetokounmpo to New York, I'm good with it. But my personal opinion is that I don't know if that would happen. So if there was any way we could get Damian Lillard, I wouldn't sneeze at that either because he's a sniper and a closer, and I'd want him. But I'm not convinced that that's going to happen, neither scenario. But any one of those two would give me would bring Christmas to me early, bro. It's just that simple. Love that. Love that. Would you? Uh, what do you think about the Embiid uh, talk? Because I'm hearing rumors about Embiid possibly, oh, you know, after now. this year. I, I, I don't believe know. that. Daryl Morey ain't going <laughs> to give him to, to, to New York City. Appreciate the call, though, man. Thank you so much. Ted Rowe in North Carolina. You're live with Stephen A. What's up? Hey, what's going on, Mr. Stephen A. Smith? How are you, man? Uh, first thing is, for, I'm doing well. Hope you are. First thing is foremost, I'm a big fan of yours. Thank you. Um, yes, sir. Um, so I have two questions for you. First question is what are your thoughts on Daniel Jones and the Giants? I'm getting sick of my friends slandering Daniel Jones. I'm sick of it, Stephen A. Why, 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 why are you sick of slandering? What has he done to not earn slander? He got him to the playoffs last year. He had a relatively decent season. Thank God Brian Dable is the coach. Um, you got Saquon Barkley, Sterling Shepard is back healthy. Um, obviously, you picked up Darren Waller. I think that's a big, big deal, and that's going to help you immensely. But it's not like the Giants are anything to write home about as of yet. And Daniel Jones is no superstar. He lucky he getting the $40 million he getting. You know that, right? I mean, Stephen A., he is pretty good. He's not bad. I, 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 we didn't say he was a scrub, bro. We just said don't act like he's knocking anybody's socks off. What's your second question? Uh, Stephen, Mr. Stephen what's, what's your second? That's, no, uh, no, 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 wait a minute. Don't waste my time arguing with me about no damn Daniel Jones. We ain't going to do that. Yes, sir. We ain't going to waste yes, my sir. energy with that. Now, 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 you could, you, could, you could pick something else, but not Daniel Jones. Go ahead, bro. Uh, my second question is, uh, I know that Shannon Sharp uh, has been doing uh, debating for the past seven years. Uh, what do you expect from him um, coming to first take, and what is he bringing to the table? Bro, let me tell you something right now. Shannon Sharp's a three-time Super Bowl champion and a Hall of Famer. Who knows football? I expect him to bring that. Now, obviously, he can talk about far more than that because we saw him for six and a half years on FS1. But what people don't realize is that as great as he is, and he is great, and I love working with him, and I'm proud to have him as a part of the team. I'm also proud to have Ryan Clark as a part of the team. I'm also happy to have Marcus Spears as a part of the team and Mad Dog Russo as well. And I miss my brother Michael Irvin. And so what people realize and what they have to realize is that I want Shannon to be a part of that rotation, that team. Yeah, he should have his own show. You know, Ryan Clark is hosting Inside the NFL. Swagoo is doing NFL Live. Everybody's got their own show. But when you talk about first take, I think that society as a whole, you ultimately get accustomed to seeing two dudes sitting across from one another And that potentially could become stale. I think different personalities rotating in and out throughout the week and the months, I think it's helpful to a show being successful, particularly in this day and age of linear television. So that's where I'm at with it, man. But I appreciate the call. Keenan, in Halifax, you're live with Stephen A. What's up, Keenan? What up? How you doing, big dog? Talk to me, bro. What's up? Um, My question is, who is under the most pressure this coming NBA season? Ooh, that's a good question. Mm. Mm. Well, first of all, Anthony Davis signed for $186 million, $62 million a year. I mean, damn. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jalen Brown with his $300 million deal. Boston's been mm-hmm. knocking on the door. They got to deliver. Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown got to deliver. Now you got Porzingis. Now I lost you, Marcus mm-hmm. Smart, who got traded to Memphis. Okay. But I definitely think. Uh, Boston's up there. I think John ja Moran is up there after the season he had. I think you got to take Absolutely. that into consideration. And, of course, James Harden because you keep forcing your way out of teams. So yeah. it's gonna be, but you know what it really is for me? Hmm. It's the Clippers. Yep. Paul George and Kawhi Leonard, assuming they're healthy. If they're healthy, which obviously is a big ask, Paul George and Kawhi Leonard got to step up. Got Got to get it done. Got to get it done. Got to get it done. Period. Yeah, I. All yeah, right. I completely agree. All right, man. Thank you for the call. I completely agree. I got to get on out of here, Yuli. I appreciate the call, man. Thank you so much. Eight 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 say es. I'm sorry. Eight 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 s a s five three zero three. That's eight 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 
727-5303. I got to get on out of here. But I thank y'all for calling into the show. I hope y'all enjoyed it, and I'm happy there were no technical difficulties this time around. Thanks for watching another episode of the Stephen A. Smith Show. You can watch me every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday over the digital airwaves of YouTube. I'm aiming to have my show to you by 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, okay? Um, even though I'll be taping it an hour in advance, I'll be alerting you via my social media pages to the number that is 888-SAS-5303. That's 888-727-5303. So you can call in literally while I'm taping the show and I'm taking your calls in real time. Make sure to click and follow the Stephen A. Smith Show on YouTube. Click the bell to get notified of all of our new content. And be sure to pick up a copy of my New York Times bestselling uh, book, Straight Shooter, a memoir of second chances and first takes. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, this is Stephen A. signing off. Peace and love. 